Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Rod Marsh's funeral service, celebration of his life. This morning will bring back many memories and it will be a great celebration. And just a couple of housekeeping announcements, ladies and gentlemen. Can I remind you to turn your mobile phones off to silent or off altogether? Uh, I'd also like to mention to you that the area is a smoke-free zone also. Uh, that's both inside and inside, inside and outside of this room and the stadium. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our host today, James Brayshaw, who will lead us in Rod's service. Thanks very much. Hi everyone. I'd like to echo Simon's welcome to you all here today on behalf of Auntie Roz, Paul, Dan and Jamie, Jane, Joe and Nat, the kids, as well as Rod's brother Graham and the extended Marsh family. When this invitation arrived in all of our inboxes or maybe in your mailbox to this beautiful place on this beautiful day, it was perfectly titled A Celebration of Life. I was sitting on the plane on the way here trying to think of anyone I knew who had crammed as much into 74 years as Rod Marsh. And after 10 minutes, I gave up. Going right back to growing up in Armidale in Perth, studying, becoming a teacher, playing for WA and the schoolboys as they were known then, moving clubs to get the gloves on at A grade level, getting picked at a young age to play for his beloved state of WA, which was of course the launching pad for one of the more celebrated cricket careers in Australian history. But if you focus only on what Rod did on the cricket field, you'd miss so much. If he had any say with his trademark humility, you'd nearly miss the lot. A loving and devoted husband to Aunty Roz, a superb father to the boys, and by extension, father-in-law to their wives. And as the kids arrived, Bacchus's smile just got wider. We'll hear about all of that soon when his eldest son, Paul, speaks. Not only a brilliant cricketer, he was an even better teammate. Some of his oldest and best mates shared the West Australian and Australian dressing room with Rod. Those stories are going to be heard shortly as well. He absolutely loved the game of golf. He was a passionate member, first at Lake Caron up in Perth, then for a long time at Kuyonga here in Adelaide. A couple of his great mates from his midweek group will be up here shortly. Can't wait to hear from them. But we are here to celebrate. We're here to respect the passing of a great man and to celebrate a life lived to the fullest. And to start, it's my pleasure to welcome Rod's brother, who also played schoolboy cricket for WA before making the very wise decision to settle on the game of golf and 69 tournament victories around the world on all tours just underscores the fact that that was a very good decision. Please welcome Graham Marsh. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Jamie. You're right, it was the right decision. Now, coming, thank you for coming here today to help us celebrate the life of Rodney Marsh. As his only brother, I have known him longer than anybody else on this planet. 74 years, four months, almost to be precise. He would be honored that you've come to show your respect. I know, as does his family, he would be very upset if you come only to mourn. He would expect nothing less of you than a great celebration of his life, with stories, memories of only the happy times. One of my earliest recollections of Ros were in our times playing cricket in our backyard in Armadale, a sleepy little town 18 miles south of Perth. Our father, Ken, was a mad cricketer and golfer. Who would have thought it? He'd come home from work and we'd immediately have him throw a cricket ball onto the cement path at different angles, speeds and heights to Rod and myself in the two-slip cordon. Rod couldn't get enough. He would throw himself at any ball that came near him. Any ball that even remotely looked one, like one directed for me, he would grab right from under my nose. 
I read a wonderful tribute to Rod, penned by his great friend Ian Chappell, descriptively recounting he had the same problem when it first slipped playing for Australia some 20 years later. I was four years older, not even a teenager at the time, but I can well remember sensing something about special about his skill and competitiveness. Ken, apart from being a fanatical sports person, was also an accomplished musician. He learned how to tickle the ivories by playing the organ at the family church up in Geraldton. Barbara wanted the best for her boys, so I was off to piano lessons and extra supervision from Dad almost every night of the week. A real pain in the butt for us has cut into valuable football and cricket time. In Mum's mind, concert pianists was the chosen profession at Carnegie Hall, and Carnegie Hall was the stadium. Little did either of our parents know there would be many stadiums, but Rod wouldn't be behind a Steinway. The other lucid memory at a range around age 13 was when I was on the Armidale Primary School sports round, kicking a football around. The local bully from up the road arrived and decided for whatever reason he wanted to pick a fight. I threw a few punches, missed he threw a few, landed them. Being bigger and stronger, I knew I was in for the proverbial ass kicking. Suddenly, like a flash of light, Rod came screaming up behind this guy and out of nowhere latched onto him like a panther does its prey. The guy never knew what the hell hit him. And when he did, there was a flurry of fists and abuse coming at him like I had never witnessed before. Seeing this, I gained a bit of bravado, went back into the fray. Two on one, this bloke decided it was over for him. Yep, over for him. And he left to a barrage of language from Rod. The last sentence being, don't you ever pick on my brother again. I learned two valuable lessons from my little brother that day. I always wanted to be on his team. Secondly, he'd do anything to protect his family. Rod's introduction to golf was around eight or nine. Both Ken and I were right-handers, being a Molly Duca left hand. Rod couldn't figure out what he was going to hit the golf ball with right-handed clubs. He swung left-handed. He had to hit the ball with the back of the club head. Not an easy thing to do. Then he decided if he turned the right-hand club upside down and played left-handed, he could someone hit the ball with the full face of the clubhouse of the club. Ken and myself peed our pants as we watched all this unfold. He persevered with this for some time with mixed results. After a few weeks of watching Rod struggle, Ken simply said, if you want to play golf, mate, you get on the other side of the ball. He listened, very difficult for Rod, and from then on he took to the game like a pig in mud. And so it was then Rod Marsh, the right-handed golfer, was born. And this was my very first introduction to Rod's fierce determination. Once he set his mind to something, he never gave up easily. He figured things out largely by, lead, by believing nothing was ever that difficult. He had an innate ability to cut to the chase, throw all the peripheral rubbish out the window, and concentrate on what he thought was important. This thought process he applied to everything he did throughout his entire life. It proved invaluable as it allowed him to weather the lows of his career and bounce back stronger and more resilient to challenge another day. Once Rob thought he had figured it out, it was always a full-on, aggressive approach. With an ounce of success, he all came, also became supremely cheeky and confident. When in this state of mind, it was fun to sit back and watch the antics. You knew the crash and burn was coming, but it was even more hilarious watching him justify his way out of his over-exuberance. Rod's teen years were full of cricket. Cricket was his passion. He loved being with mates, and the truth be known, beer drinking after every game was the highlight of the day. In 1969, Rod and Ros were married. I was Rod's best man, and my thoughts at the time were, I wonder if this young, innocent lady knows just what she's committed the rest of her life to. If my memory serves me in a jovial but half-serious manner, I made the suggestion that it really wasn't too late for her to do a runner. Thankfully, she never listened. In no time, Ros proved to be the formidable woman, supportive and kind to the core, and along with Rob, the perfect protector of their three sons. 
She was his soulmate, joined for life. Her strength and courage have been on full display since Rod's passing. Rod wouldn't have doubted it for a second. He knew Rod was always there for him, no matter the circumstances. Now, through our professional lives, we often chatted about our chosen past, not rem reminiscing about performances, but about experiences, places we'd visited, and great characters we'd met along the way. Rod was never about stats. He was about playing and performing for his team and baggy green. He just loved to win, then celebrate. Ros wasn't beyond psychological tactics. That was all part of the game for him, the banter getting into the opponent's mind. What he couldn't tolerate was cheating. He loathed cheating and made it clear. In recent years, when he was struggling with his golf game, I asked him if, I'd, if he'd give me some advice about his lessons, about his swing. He would always say before I opened my mouth, Graham, forget the technical crap. Just one foot and put me in a position to hit the ball and I'll figure the rest out. He would always frequently go on to say, brother, most of this coaching is rubbish. Way too much information and over coaching in all sports today. Wait a minute, I say. You spent the last 20 years of your life running and setting up academies all over the world, coaching young and aspiring cricketers, and you tell me coaching's overrated? If that's the case, do you mind telling me what exactly you've been doing all these years? Well, with a stupid look which he had in his usual smart-ass grin, he retorted, Brother, that's a bloody good question. <laughs> Many will remember Rod as the larrikin, the formidable driving, diving wicketkeeper, the swashbuckling batsman, iron gloves, backers, bold lily called Marsh, the lover of fine red wine, the passionate golfer, the king of sledge, both on the cricket field and I can tell you even more so on the golf course. He might well be remembered by many for telling a yarn and holding a room in the palm of his hand. All of these things and many more are certainly true. But I always remember my brother Rod for his devotion, loyalty, love of his family and friends. His legacy will continue to shine brightly through his three sons, Paul, Dad and Jaden. They say younger brothers often walk in the shadow of their older brothers. But baby brother, it's been an honour to walk in your shadow. Thank you. Rodney William Marsh was one of the greatest wicket keepers of all time and one of the great blokes. The truck driver's son was the first Australian gloveman to score a test century, retiring after 96 tests with 355 dismissals, more than any before him. If you grew up in the 70s and early 80s and you were a wicket keeper, you had only one hero. Macho Mo, the bushy sideburns and confident swagger. This man was up for every contest, on his day or yours. He swooped like Superman for legside catches off the fast men in the Super 70s when the Chapel brothers, Lily and Tomo, were putting the cool back into test cricket. A man who loved his mates and a cold beer as much as the game itself. Marsh's eternal gift to the Australian cricket team was its victory song, Under the Southern Cross. He loved to belt it out, passing the choir master's role to his great mate Alan Border after his retirement in 1984. Marsh made his test debut against England at age 23 at the Gabba in 1970. His early nickname was Iron Gloves after a challenging first test, but his teammates soon realised he was a man of steel. Greg Chappell says he played with... Marsh stood apart because he'd killed for it too. He got a set of gloves for his eighth birthday. The coach said he was one of the few kids who never took a step back from the stumps. 
God's mother wanted him to be a concert pianist, but behind the wicket was where he made the music. And that's as Marsh was coming through the ranks in the Perth suburb of Armada, another son of a truck driver was making his name 20 k's up the road in Jarrodale. Dennis Keith Lilly. DK and Bacchus became one of the greatest double acts in cricket history. And he's gone this time. Court Marsh Bold Lily. Court Marsh Bold Lily was written into the test scorecards 95 times. They played so much together that Rod reckoned he could tell where DK would bowl without even talking to him. Rod lived for wife Rose and sons Paul, Dan and Jamie. He just loved them. The boys would join their dad on the golf course competing for the big calf cup, named the honour of Rod's formidable calf muscles. For nearly 50 years, he dominated world cricket as a selector, coach, player, commentator, and a lovable rogue who never lost his sense of humour. Bacchus, thanks for inspiring me and so many others. Rest in peace, mate. Perfectly put together by a man who knows plenty about keeping for both WA and Australia here in the room, I'm pretty sure Adam Gilchrist. Rod began playing first class cricket in the late 60s and like Gilly, he was first selected as a batsman only for WA. Gilly, of course, for New South Wales, but soon took over as the keeper and inherited the nickname Bacchus, which actually came from my father, who's here today. Also played for many years with Rod at Sheffield Shield level for WA. WA used to go on the Eastern States tour back in those days, knock over all the away games in the one hit. Started here in Adelaide, then of course Melbourne, Sydney, finished in Brisbane. No Tassie, unfortunately, Dan, back in those days, so there was only four stops. But these blokes played that long ago that they used to catch a train from here to Melbourne for the second game. Dad and Rod were sharing a carriage when the train stopped at a station about 60 k's west of Melbourne. The old man looked out the window and the name of the station was partially obscured. The only word that they could see was Marsh. And the old man said, have a look at that. So they both were looking out of the train as it pulled out of the station and of course the rest of the sign became visible and the Bacchus that preceded the Marsh on the sign came into view. Bacchus Marsh, for those who are aware, is of course the home of the great Dougie Hawkins, but that's another story. So the old man, as they're pulling out of the train station said, that's it. From now on, you will be called Bacchus. And for the next 50 odd years, he was universally known as Bacchus. I'm not sure either of them at the time were aware of the perfect synergy and perhaps irony behind the, behind the fact that the Roman god of wine is also Bacchus. Might have drunk a lot of wine when he played, but by Christ, he made up for it when he retired. Outside of his beautiful family, the two things Bacchus loved the most were his mates and red wine, and it wasn't always in that order. Three of his best mates for 60 plus years, teammates for the best part of 20 of those years, are here to talk about what an amazing teammate Rod Marsh was. They are John Inverarity, Bruce Laird and Dennis Lee. Neil Harvey, Stump Rod Marsh, Bold Tony Man, The Whacker, summer of 61, 62, 60 years ago. Rod was 14. It was the first time we played together. Combined schools against the Governor's Eleven, which included Richie Benno and Neil Harvey. That day, Rod was mischievous, full of bubbling enthusiasm, and he was good. None of this had changed when he retired from cricket 23 years later. In 1965, he arrived at UWA and began an arts degree. He claimed his major reason for enrolling was cricket and to keep wicket to Tony Mann, who had been taking bags of wickets for uni. Rod revelled in carefree university life and the youthful exuberance of the uni team. At that time, he was, by his own admission, 
a tearaway. Rod lived out of town and he often stayed with one of his teammates on a Saturday night, sometimes at Ross McLean's family home. Recently, Ross told me that his mother, a quiet and conservative Baptist woman, had said to him, Ross, I'd rather you didn't spend too much time with Rod Marsh. I think, I don't think he's a good influence on you. I told Bacchus he loved her and added, very smart lady, Mrs. McLean. <laughs> Rod's uni years were very significant for him. Most importantly, for meeting fellow student Roslyn May Wilson. On their first date, he took Roz to the Berry Oscar Ballet. Three years later, they were man and wife, soulmates, each other's best friend, confident and rock. Together they created three fine sons and an always welcoming home. From a young age, Rod, in no way a show-off, knew he was good. He had an abundance of confidence and cheek. He wrote to me when I was in England in 68. He signed the letter, Yours sincerely, Australia's next keeper. He made his debut for WA a few months later against the West Indies touring here and during the university exam period. In 2010, a UWA professor told me he had kept one of Rod Marsh's geography exam scripts from 68 as it was unique. He sent me a copy. It read, 9.15am, dear professor, I have a pressing engagement at the WACA and cannot stay any longer. I requested the deferment to sit the paper in January, cricket commitments permitting, Rod Marsh. Again I called Bacchus, his response, yep, but I told a lie. I had no intention of ruining my summer and sitting that paper. <laughs> he then made his test debut just two years later. I've never known Rod to be sad. Angry, yes, though not for long, but never sad. He was fiercely competitive and tough. Although a beautiful gloveman, his fingers took a pummeling, but he never had a scab. He said, what's the point? If it's broken, it's broken. If it's not, it's not. Either way, I'm playing. Rod was tough, but kind, thoughtful and sensitive. He wept at every funeral he attended. And mate, you've been the cause of a few tears these past few weeks. The man possessed the full 360 degrees of humanity. He was not closed down to any emotion. He was a facilitator of love, friendship and good times. He loved life and people with huge warmth and generosity of spirit and how people loved him more than anyone. Roz and their family. As head coach of the Cricket Academy in the 1990s, Rod was different. He was unique. He focused on his charges becoming independent, resilient and thinking cricketers. He had clear general expectations and delighted in being difficult to read on occasions and a bit unpredictable. His general expectations reflected his principal values of life and the way cricket should be played and celebrated, and on these he insisted. He mastered that quizzical look, take me on if you dare, and you're not quite sure, are you? An England Lions player at the end of a tour to India asked Rod with much trepidation if he could fly to Perth to play club cricket, not back to Heathrow. Rod took out his notebook and with a very serious air and began writing, adding, this might be possible if you observe certain strict conditions. He gravely handed over the note stating, here are the names of three Western Australian wines which are not to be missed. I'd start with the Shiraz from Margaret River. He instinctively treated those at the academy 
just as a highly qualified mentor would. He played a major role in their becoming men of substance, integrity and mischief. And Roz played a huge complementary role to Rod in making this academy such a success and how they all loved her too. Rod was a genuine leader in every game he played. He should have captained a great deal more than he did. He had a nuanced feel for the game and a great rapport with his bowlers and his off-field skills were of the highest order. And when he did get the opportunity, he was brilliant. A force of nature and a force for good has left us, but not in spirit and not without a treasure trove of memories. You have enriched our lives, Bacchus, and we shall be eternally grateful we shared your journey with you. Farewell. Um, I first met Bacchus 47 years ago, which makes me feel old, but uh, I was selected in the 74-75 WA Sheffield Shield team. My first impression of Bacchus was how down to earth he was and how tough. He immediately made you feel welcome and that you were an important part of the team. We hit it off pretty well from the start, mainly because we both enjoyed a smoke and a beer. Uh, in those days, we also, was also handy because Benson Hedges was the major sponsor and Bacchus had found an ally in me that he had someone else to help him carry the free cartons of smokes around. We went on many cricket trips with WA and Australia and World Series cricket and because of the nature of the cricket trips, we got to know each other pretty well. As a cricketer, I don't think there's been a fairer or more universally loved person than Bacchus. He treated all opponents with great respect. Every team he played against, where possible, he would go and have a beer and a chat with them after the day's play. I remember once I said to him, I'm not going in there, they've been trying to knock our blocks off and you want me to have a beer with them. And he said something along the lines of, don't be a weak, starts with P, is the right thing to do, it's just cricketers like you. So I learnt from that moment on not to have a beer with Bacchus in the rooms. Bacchus would not tolerate certain things, and if you don't mind, I phrased a couple of them like he would say. He said, "Don't be up yourself. Don't be a smart ass. Don't cheat. Don't lie. Don't be rude to people." And he said, "Don't sledge," which Graham sort of indicated he, he was a bit of a sledger. But, um, I heard, and once the only time I've ever heard him say something like along those lines is um, a batsman. He nicked the catch behind and he turned around and said to Bacchus he didn't hit it. And, and Bacchus in, a, in his stern but polite way said, listen sunshine, you do the batting and we'll do the effing bowling. Um, and also there's certain things that Bacchus insisted upon. Loyalty, respect for the past, treat everyone with respect, play for your team and give kids a chance. He never verbalised those qualities outright, but he understood from playing with him, they were his mantra. I felt he was the spiritual leader of every team he played in. Away from cricket, the things that I admired about Bacchus were, forced and fo first and foremost, his love of his family, his love of his life, he was always positive. He always saw the good things in people. He was extremely proud of all the young players he had through his academies and the fact that he instilled many of his values in them. He was a perfect choice to guide them as young men. He was always honest with you. He would always tell you the truth, even if it was not what you wanted to hear. And so he said, sometimes you need the home truth. Speaking from personal experience, he helped me on more than one occasion by doing that. He was a loyal friend. One example was about 10 years ago, his best friend from school in uni days, Bob Johnson, became ill. And he was in palliative care in Geraldton, Bob's hometown. It's about 450 k's north of Perth. And Bacchus sat by his side for five days to comfort him. He loved music. 
I think he thought he had a good voice. Two of his favourite songs were Bobby McGee and In the Jungle, The Mighty Jungle. And when he'd had a few beers, he would occasionally have a sing. And he had the movements pretty well down pat. So. The only time I ever saw Bacchus display any fear was when he was in or around water, in particular the ocean, anywhere past knee height. I'm not sure if he could even swim. He, he never committed either way. He said he, where he grew up in Armidale, there wasn't anywhere to learn to swim. Besides, can you imagine him trying to swim? Those legs would be like having two anchors <laughs> holding her down. More recently, we've kept in touch on a regular basis, most of the time talking about, but really, cricket. We would discuss everything from politics to climate change. Then, of course, he would spend hours talking about his beloved Dockers. Several times during the year, if they were playing badly, he would ring me during the game, because we're in WA, saying he was going to turn the TV off and proceed to tell me which players he'd drop. If ever a player looked like he didn't have a crack or took a backward step, Bacchus would take a long time to get him back in the good books. I, like everyone, are going to miss Bacchus immensely. I'm going to miss his voice, his humour, his cheeky grin, his kindness and friendship. Rest in peace, my friend. I still can't believe that our mate and mate to many isn't around anymore. It's taken me days to be able to write my thoughts down on this amazing bloke. I don't want to talk about his cricket ability, as that, that's been very well documented. It's the person, Rod Marsh, that I love. I've got to say that it wasn't always that way. It's something that, that grew over time, even after our careers were finished. Early in my career, our friendship started badly. One day after a day's play, him unusually with a beer in his hand and me pouring a full strength soft drink, ready to chat, he said to me, got to tell you, I don't trust you. <laughs> Taken aback, I inquired with apprehension, why? He said, because my old man Ken said never trust anyone who doesn't drink. <laughs> of course, in those days, a bit different now, but sport including cricket, had a, a drinking culture. And being a to teetotaler was considered different. This difference never interfered with his, his allegiance, though, to all in the team, and you were still made to feel a part of it. Gradually, our friendship blossomed, and we became great mates on and off the field. I'll miss our regular, almost weekly phone chats and regular catch-ups with him and Roz, whether in WA, South Australia, or on our, on our many trips away together, be it in the Barossa Valley, Coonawarra, on a houseboat on the Murray River, or as far away as Japan or the UK. We had so much fun together over, these, over many decades. We shared a love of many things, including music and wine, and would spend many hours enjoying music quizzes, discussion, discussing wine, or up-and-coming cricketers. I, I'm sure a lot of people know, I love playing practical jokes. And an ideal opportunity arose on a trip many years ago to try out our new four-wheel drives on a remote bush, rough bush track south of Perth. The Lily and Marsh families were travelling in separate cars along a track when I noticed a massive eight-foot snake slithering across in front of our car. I pointed it out to the Marsh family travelling behind. And as fate would have it, the Marsh car punctured a tyre about 50 metres on from our sighting. The spare tyre was bolted underneath the car, so I said I would watch out for the snake 
while Bacchus apprehensively got under the back of the car to lower the spear. Never one to miss an opportunity, I pinched one of his ankles. <laughs> Thinking the snake had bit him, he tried to jump up only to hit his head on the undercarriage <laughs> and then shot out from under the car and jumped in. <laughs> I just couldn't stop laughing. However, it backfired as he refused to get out and I was left to change the tyre with one eye looking out for that bloody reptile. <laughs> when I'd retired from cricket, people often asked me if I missed playing. My answer was no, I don't. But I do miss my teammates of 14 to 15 years. Again, I miss my mate and will we'll keep remembering the good times. He was a one-off. Let's all celebrate a life well lived. Bloody hell, Stump. I was going all right until you got started. Um, golf, as you heard from Graham earlier, is a massive part of Rod's life and he was more than handy at it. Started off in the West, brought his love of the game with him here to Adelaide, spent most of his adult, adult life with a single figure handicap. Don't know whether that might have drifted a little, boys, as he entered his 70s. Roachie's telling me he was holding late singles, but he loved the Kuyonga Golf Club. Played with the same group of blokes midweek there for as long as I can remember. They used to start ridiculously early in the morning so the tarmac was nice and clear ahead of them and the round usually didn't finish after the 18th hole. He also loved playing with his wife, Auntie Roz, wherever they went in the world and, of course, locally. And I'm not quite sure, Auntie Roz, how you put up with him later in life because my last couple of games he became a very bloody grumpy golfer. Um, but two of his oldest mates from Cooey were part of that midweek tee-off time religiously for more than 20 years and they're here today. Leon Holmes and Jeff Roach. Golf, definitely one of his greatest passions. I first met Rod just not long after he came here uh, to set up the set up down at uh, Henley Beach. I got a phone call from a mate of mine in Perth, Bobby Slade. He said, Holmesy, have you caught up with Marsh yet? I hadn't known Rod over in Perth when I was there. I said, no, Slade, no, I haven't. We well, said, you bloody will have to, because he's a good mate of mine, he's a good bloke, and he said, I know you'll love him and he'll probably love you too. I said, OK, give us, a, give us a phone number. So I got the phone number and I read, uh, rang Rod. We arranged to meet at the British Hotel for a beer. And he said, uh, how will I know you? I said, you won't know me, but I've known, I'll know you. I've seen you on TV so many times. We talked a lot about golf. Uh, we talked a lot about wine, as has been said before. And not a lot about cricket. I think I might have been a bit of a relief from cricket. And uh, so it was mainly golf and, and other, other things. We started having a game of golf, and again, Rod was the instigator of this. We started having an early game at six o'clock in the morning during the week at Kionga. We got a couple of other guys to join us. It was Jack Clark and the late Mike Hammer. So we hit off at six o'clock, played around, only took about three hours in the, at that time. But he was very, very lucky because Kuyonga runs alongside Henley Beach Road and just down the road was the uh, academy. So once we finished golf, he was at work in five minutes and it took the others, like us, about an hour before we got home and got, got organised to, to, uh, to go to work. We did have quite a few small golfing holidays along with Ros and my wife Sandy, which were great. But there was one, in, one uh, incident in particular that uh, I remember 
greatly, and that was when we were at Yarrawonga. He wasn't having a great day, uh, which is unusual. He always hit the ball down the middle and uh, onto the green. He was, he's a good golfer. Anyway, we got to this tee and he got out his driver and whack and hooked it, hooked it into the bush. With that, anger came out and he just hit the club on the ground. And guess what? Snapped. There's, there's the club head and here's the, very much like what we just saw with the cricket bat up there. It reminded me of that. He, he could get angry, but he never threw his clubs. I, had, I never saw him throw a club. He might have dropped one, but he never threw it. Not like a, quite a few people here in this uh, room. Uh, some of them are gold medalists at throwing clubs, I tell you. But he, he certainly showed anger through verbiage that was coming out of his mouth. He always said that I was the luckiest player he's ever played with. Now, I would suggest that we probably played between 800 and 1,000 games during the time. He used to say to me, Mr Leon, you, when you play with me and the other guys, you suck out all the luck that they've got and use it yourself. I must say, I was a bit of a lucky player in some, some occasions, but so was he. He wouldn't recognise it, though. Uh, he was always unlucky. He was always in a divot or behind a tree or something like that. See how unlucky I am, he'd say. One of the great tours we, we did do with uh, our, our Ros and Sandy, we had uh, two other couples, Jack and Sue Clark and Alf and Julie Laslett. We went to Laguna Keys when it had just was fairly new. Now Laguna Keys, if you don't know, is up, uh, up near the Whits Whits Sundays on the not on an island, but on the mainland. One of the most beautiful places you could ever be to. The complex was just magnificent. The, the golf course was excellent. And uh, the facilities were also excellent. Um, so our week, we were there for a week, and our days were like this. Seven o'clock, meet you at breakfast up at the restaurant. At 7.45, on the tee, round of golf in the carts, of course. So we finish at about a bit after 12. We go back to the house, make sandwiches, no, no drinks, you know, a cup of tea, coffee, whatever. One o'clock, back on the tee again for another round. So we do 36 holes each day. That's men and women. Then we come back and we might have a beer or two. And I can remember uh, after about the second day, Mr Rod said to me, I, by the way, I used to call him Mr Rod, he called me Mr Leon. Um, he said, Mr Leon, he said, what say we slip out and have a, another few holes before dark? You reckon? He, he, yeah, do it. It was then that I knew he was totally passionate about golf. So we'd go out, hop in the cart, and we'd, what had happened is there's a lot of other people still on the course, so we'd find a gap somewhere where we could put a ball down and hit it. So we do that, then there's other people, so we pick up the ball, we'd keep on driving round and round and round till we find gaps and this sort of thing. So we had a lot of fun then. And then it was time to have dinner and a, a few, few drinks. One, one thing that happened at Laguna Keys, which was absolutely hilarious for me anyway when I saw it, he always had difficult, uh, d difficulty on the 16th hole, which is a straightaway par four, you know, the green at the end. Around the green was a, a creek, a creek, but it didn't have any water in it. It was dry because in the middle of the year it's a dry season up in Queensland. Um, he, had, he could not hit the green with his second shot. And as we've heard before, he's absolutely determined to do things. He's going to hit this green. So he hit a good drive, and he pulled out the six iron. He said, no, Mr Leon, he said, I'm not going to hit this bloody six iron again. I nearly get on the green. He said, what are you going to do? I'll take a five iron. So he took a five iron, and guess what? He didn't make it. <laughs> With that, he threw the club on the ground. Sorry, he dropped the club on the ground threw himself on the ground, flat on his face, and his arms and legs going like this, and a great gurgles coming out of his, out of his mouth. 
If you've ever, ever seen a grown man do that, I tell you, you've got to shake your head. <laughs> Two year old, you'll be taking your lolly away from them, they'll do that sort of thing. Anyway, look, um, Kionga. There's been a bit talked about Kionga, but the friendship, look, I've got to say, Mr. Rod definitely had an aura about him. There is something about him that attracted people. And the same, it obviously happened at Kionga because he attracted people to him and they loved him and he loved them for, for doing that sort of thing. They respected him, but boy, did they give him some stick from time to time. He loved the banter and his retort or response to any banter was probably better than the original banter. And uh, he, he loved the guys down there, the camaraderie and everything that uh, goes on and golf, and golf clubs. Uh, he was right there. He was right there. And I have to say that when he was ch uh, chairman of selectors, he didn't pick the team for Australia. The boys at Kionga did. <laughs> but being right, he didn't take any notice of them anyway. So. He was always given advice. Some years ago, after this, uh, some trips, uh, we went to Mornington Peninsula with, with eight guys that, that Rod had organised. The trip was so successful, when we came back, we were all talking about how good it was. And a lot of people wanted to join, so we accepted another four into this group, and went again the next year. So that was 12. And then, that, that was so successful, other people wanted to join, so he said, oh, OK, we'll make it up to 16. So, the, and we called ourselves the long table because when we got to 16, we had this big long table for dinner and all get around it, have dinner, drinks, etc. The last long table tour was last week. And we only had 15. He was a wonderful, caring and generous friend to me and everybody. But I'd just like to refer back to Laguna Keys. Our group said, if you want to play any course or any, be in any place forever when you're in heaven, Laguna Keys will be a great golf course to be in. And what I'd like to say is that Laguna Keys has been closed and has gone for quite some years now. And we've just lost our great friend. So, Mr. Rod, I know you're up there. Laguna Keys is there and I know you'll be there. You're probably on the course right now, but if you're on the 16th hole, make sure you use your rescue club. <laughs> Rest in peace, Rod. Thank you, Leon. Sight of that beach baby whale rolling around on the fairway will never be forgotten by those who were lucky enough to observe it. Leon, I met Leon through Rodney. That's one of the best things that ever happened in my life, and we certainly have had a fantastic time together over all those periods of time. But I speak today on behalf of two Kui groups that we've mentioned the irreverently named Last Supper group and the accurately defined Long Table. Now, let me tell you that the Last Supper group um, was not a religious organisation. Um, it was chosen by Rodney from those people around that he saw playing with each other often and he wanted to have a team when he'd come back from overseas. And so he put together 12 people, some of whom he barely knew and some barely knew him. And because it was now 13, he became Hazel's and we became his disciples. That, of course, led to the, the long table. And on behalf of those two, I'm now here to tell you that no matter what anyone says, Rodney was definitely, and he's probably hearing this, was definitely an unlucky golfer. This, of course, shouldn't be surprising because whenever we pressed him about his early life and how he succeeded and whatever he did, he always modestly insisted, as he did, that it all came down to the good luck he had in his early life. Lucky to be born with talent into a loving family. 
lucky to love cricket so fiercely that it surpassed golf, baseball, football and surfing as his chosen sports and he was good at them all. Lucky to be picked to play for Australia at the dawn of a fabulous era under the chapels and then to be offered the opportunity to teach two generations of talented youngsters from around the world the art and the skill and the conduct of the game. But lucky most of all to meet the redoubtable Ros at university and to forge an unbreakable bond and a wonderful family. Now, sure, luck may have played a role in what became a glorious life, but what was far more significant than luck to everyone who came upon him through that life were the singular characteristics he forged himself. That insatiable competitive urge and will to succeed in every sphere, be it a test match or a Wednesday four ball. Rodney wanted to win, he didn't want to just win, he wanted to win big. That impish sense of fun and humour that made him the very best of company in any, any sphere that he was in. And for me, most of all, the depth and the warmth of Rodney's humanity that embraced everyone in his ambit. Nowhere was more than evident than that in the golfing group that he selected, created and bonded. We were a, a mixed, pretty mixed, but a pretty achieving bunch, often cynical and always irreverent, and yet we were, the nonetheless, we were nonetheless awed by Rodney and amazed that the man we revered and loved as our chairman actually regarded us with equal respect. And so it was in the darkest hours two weeks ago when it seemed Rodney would no longer be part of us that we took to our WhatsApp function to express our love and dismay. Here then are just a few abridged expressions of those responses from some of the lads. From Kim DeVal, a gifted graphic artist. Our family watched an abundance of cricket and loved the Australian team's heroic endeavours to make us proud. Never did I imagine that one of those heroes would become one of my great mates. Rod's genuine interest and concern for my well-being left me flattered. He seemed to be as proud to be friends with me as I was with him. His sense of fun and the pixie in him bonded us all. We were always looking for a laugh, and we had so many. I never thought this earthly bond would start, and now I can't comprehend that it will end. From Tim Roberts, a comparative newcomer to our group who has COVID and can't be here today, and he's devastated, wrote, I think about those occasions when my phone would ring and it would say Rod Marsh, and I couldn't quite believe it. Then, after a typically funny conversation, I would feel weirdly proud. They say you should beware of meeting your heroes, but in this case, reality far exceeded expectations. From Blue Lake, Billy de Garris, the unofficial mayor of Mount Gambier, one of our lawyers, a case of defamation. While our goodbyes were said through the night, he was still with us. I hope he just felt the love. Rest in peace to a legend who walked with kings, but always kept a common touch. From Assistant Police Commissioner Scott Deval, who unfortunately could not be here today. So devastating for such a great man and friend to go so suddenly. An amazing innings for an absolute legend. Rod had the ability to entertain and hold court with prowess, but always with humility. Okay, Rodney of course was not entirely perfect. In fact, he could become quite waspish in the face of a defeat. His treatment of my, his great mate here, Mr. Rod. Once recently, when, Rod, when Leon had completed his fourth successive 40-yard 40, uh, 40 putt on the last hole to win the match, Rodney came back in seeding, as always. He hated losing to Leon. Didn't mind playing with him, but he hated losing him. And he came back and he said, Leon Lavishane. <laughs> now, that might be, that's an in-joke to some people, but ask a cricketer about it, you might well know. Then there was the wine. God, the wine. Anyone foolish enough to bring a lovely bottle of Pinot Noir or a cheeky little Grenache to lunch could, uh, would be routinely ignored. Just sit there, not even a gasp. Even those bearing Shiraz and Cab Sav might be sent to the sin bin if it came from an unfavoured winery or an unlikely region. Smart guys, of course, would come along with a Yolumba signature or a Rusden Black Guts, 
and he would have, he's at, they're invited, he, he's gush all over them. They had his whole attention. Till about two o'clock when he realised that if he didn't get in his car soon, Ros would be home from bridge before he was. <laughs> Rodney hated snakes, as uh, Dennis has told us. He had no regard for three putts and he didn't like slow players on the course and he certainly hated slow payers at the bar. Crows fans were anathema to him. Terrible people. He lived here for 30 years, never once had any notice for the Crows, especially if they'd sneak past his beloved Frio the week before, which may well happen this weekend. And he also, in my opinion, had a, a totally jaundiced view of journalists and the media, with one or two exceptions. One of them's there and his dad's around here as well. And maybe you. me. And you. And me. Maybe. Anyway, enough. Uh, in his beautifully crafted autobiography, and, and often, Rod did maintain that once he'd finished with an undertaking, he didn't miss it. Go on to something else. Not cricket, not coaching, not even beer. But that pathway is no longer an option for any of us who have ever been touched by the Rodney Marsh persona. For anyone who has ever been touched by Rodney, for, for wherever we are, for wherever we will be, it might be at this oval, it might be at Kuyonga, it might be on a Friday or Saturday night when you suddenly get a call saying, let's go out to a restaurant. It might be in our homes, it might be in our hearts. But we will always consider now, we can't miss the man who we regard very much as as fine a human being as we've ever known. Thank you, Ros, for letting us take part today. Thank you. For those of you who aren't aware, we are here today in the McGeary Room. And I know looking around the room, there's some boys from the Eastern States. I can see Jeff Thompson, Carl Rackerman, Ian Healy, AB, old teammates who have come from, from Queensland, Pigeon McGrath is from New South Wales. The Academy boys from that part of the world probably aren't aware that the McGarry Medal is given to the best and fairest player in the SANFL every year, so this is a storied room. And Port Adelaide and Adelaide play their home games here at the Adelaide Oval. So the fact that there's a Fremantle Dockers scarf in this room would bring great joy to Rod Marsh. And a smile was never far from Bacchus's face. It's one of the main reasons he has and had so many friends and admirers. But the biggest smile was always reserved for his family, as the speakers have so beautifully said. Birthdays, Christmas days, milestone celebrations, weddings, the arrival of grandkids, they were comfortably the happiest days of Rod's life. Gilly touched on it before, the annual Big Calf Cup where the boys had fought it out over various golf courses around Australia over a weekend was always massive. And as uh, Adam said, called the Big Calf Cup because of Bacchus's obscenely large calves, which he single-handedly handed on to the boys, certainly Daniel. <laughs> but it was something he looked forward to every year. He'd ring prior to going on it and then he'd ring at the back of it. And then I'd have to ring the boys to find out what actually happened because Backers had laid that much bloody mayo on it. But he loved his family so much and they loved him even more. It's time to hear from the Marsh family and here's Backus' oldest son, Paul. For me, your dad was probably the finest role model of being a hard competitor, but a genuine and caring human being who always had the high good of the game as his lighthouse. If your ultimate worth is the extent to which you improve the lives of others, he carries a fortune to wherever he is lucky enough to have him now. Words could never do justice to how much respect, gratitude and appreciation I have for what Rod did for me and taught me about cricket, more importantly, about life. He was a fucking legend, your old man. Universally loved, authentic always, 
and loved his family and mates. Mum said I could swear, so. <laughs> um, it's been an incredibly tough and emotional few weeks for our family, but as we've got today, today's celebration of Dad's life, the two overriding emotions I have about him are pride and gratitude. Pride for the life he lived, the humbleness with which he lived it, his achievements, the people he influenced and helped, and to the family he raised. I need to just take a sip because my mouth's very dry. The messages I read out at the start are but a small few of the hundreds our family have received from all over the world, and we are so appreciative of the support we've had over the last few weeks. Dad was obviously a great cricketer, but I think people loved him because of the way he went about playing the game, his care for others, his sense of fun and his impact on the next generation. He kept things simple. He hated seeing people overcomplicate things and he lived his whole life with integrity and humility. He was the most honest person I've known and in so many of the messages we've received from cricketers he coached, spoke to him being hard but fair, feedback between the eyes but not behind the back. As sons, we also benefited from this. But despite his hard exterior, he deeply cared about the people around him. He had an incredibly soft heart and took so much joy from the achievement of his family and friends. We've already had a number of people reach out to us over the last few weeks and share stories with us about how he helped them find success or happiness, a lot of things we didn't even know about. And I have a feeling there's probably more of these to come. He was always about the team and so many of the tributes we've received have spoken to this and we're, we're so proud that he'll be remembered that way. He was a, a work hard, play hard person and he imparted this on all of us as well as the cricketers he coached. He could also spot from a mile away if he'd played up and he took great joy in testing you out the next day. As youngsters in Perth, Dan, myself and a great friend of ours, David Church, who incidentally had a very marsh shaped body on him, had had a big night um, and, and as we got home, Churchy had left a bit of that night's dinner in our bathroom before going to bed. Dad had clearly heard Churchy's struggles because as soon as we were all up the next morning, Dad came bounding down the stairs to where we were all sitting, walked straight to his bar fridge and pulled out a can of emu bitter and walked straight over to Churchy and just took the top off right next to Churchy's face. I think he also may have lit up a cigar and said, how are you feeling this morning, Churchy? Churchy immediately turned as green as that can of emu bitter and within seconds was back in the bathroom leaving the rest of the previous night's dinner behind. Dad thought it was hilarious and as many of the boys he coached at the academies in Australia and England could attest, he always knew what you are up to and he always held people accountable. But he genuinely loved people enjoying themselves. He let us and the, and the boys he coached make their own decisions, but if they were poor decisions, he saw an opportunity for a life lesson. It would be fair to say I received my fair share of life lessons. Um, Dad travelled the world with Mum and was always looking for the next adventure. Cricket provided many and cruise ships were their latest love until the Ruby Princess and COVID put paid to that. No challenge was ever too big and he would say, of course it can be done and we can do it. And most times he did. He took on jobs in England and Dubai at a time when most other people would be slowing down. He made a huge success of these jobs, just as he'd done with most things he tackled. Mum tells a story about when her and Dad first started dating and he was adamant he was going to play cricket for Australia. At this stage he wasn't even playing for WA, so I think it may have been a line he was rolling with to attract the ladies, but he did make it and it turned into a life and a half in the game. So, so much to be proud of. Gratitude's my other emotion um, and I'm incredibly grateful for the time we had together, the fun we had, the support during the tough times, the opportunities he gave all of us and the values and character he imparted on us as people. He instilled a love of sport in all three of us boys. Our childhoods were sport, sport, sport. And then for Dan and I, our careers have also been in sport. Nearly all my childhood memories were of playing and watching sport. We watched Dad play all over Australia and in England. And when he was playing, um, we would find a game at the cricket ground with whichever other kids were prepared to take on the Marsh boys. Our games of cricket didn't just extend to the cricket venues. Hotel corridors were the scene of many of a backyard test match and on one occasion we even got a match started in the aisle of a Qantas jumbo jet. 
now known as the Mile High Cricket Club, uh, much to the disgust of the Qantas staff. It wasn't just cricket, you've obviously heard about golf. He loved to play golf, um, although, as has been alluded to, to play with him you'd often wonder if he hated it um, or loved it, such was the level of profanity he directed himself. Lucky none of us took after him in that respect. Um, and he loved AFL. He was a mad and long-suffering Fremantle Docker, Docker supporter, as you've heard. And each pre-season, particularly since I've been working in footy, I'd get a call from him after he'd analysed the Fremantle list and he'd tell me, I think this year is the Dockers' year. And he'd go on to explain why he thought so, which always included his tip for, for which obscure Dockers player would win the Brownlow medal of that year. Um, commiserations to Jordan Clark, who's his tip for this year. <laughs> That's right, you need to Google Jordan. Um, one group of people that will be breathing a bit easier with Dad's passing is the AFL umpiring fraternity. It didn't even have to be a Dockers game for him to lose his self-control over what he deemed to be a poor umpiring decision, and Mum would just shake her head in dismay. Dad always loved golf, but in his later years it became, after family, his greatest passion. Um, you've heard from Leon and Rochi, and he loved all those guys in the Kuyonga Golf Club. You've also heard about the, um, the annual Easter Big Calf Cup, which was really one of the highlights um, of all of our lives, and it's something that we've done and look forward to. Look forward to every year. Um, it's taken us all. I've lasted longer than I thought it would. Um, it's taken us all around Australia as well as America and New Zealand. Apologies to my wife Jane, but the best two weeks of my life to date was the trip that Dad, Dan, Jamie, and I had to America um, for the 2012 Big Cup Cup. A week at the US Masters and a week playing golf in Florida with the four of us and Dad's brother Graham is something I'm just so glad we did. So many memories, so many laughs, so many beers and wine. Um, how grateful we, are. we all are that we had that. Um, the other thing about the, the weekend is it's for all 14 of us as a family get together. and It's something that, you know, again, it's a, it's a family tradition that we'll continue on with. You've also heard about Dad's other passion, which was red wine. Apparently when mum and dad first moved to Adelaide, they were invited to a dinner party and dad turned up with a slab of beer on his shoulder. Um, not very cultured, but he soon worked out that um, South Australian produced some decent reds and it's something he's almost obsessive about um, to his passing. So red wine, music, sport were the connecting themes for all of us in recent years. Once dad retired, he got into a routine of golf three or four times a week and on Tuesdays he went to Dan Murphy's looking for the latest red wine bargain. Us boys would get a text or a call most Tuesdays with the latest bargain that he'd promote with such enthusiasm it used to make me laugh. Dad lived his life with a set of values that he's passed on to all of us boys and we in turn are passing on to our kids. He called them in his book The Ten Commandments and they included values such as respect, accountability, selflessness, passion and fun, throw in honesty and integrity and that pretty much summed him up. I'm incredibly grateful for the example that he set for all of us to learn from. He was a fantastic father and grandfather. And mum could not have wished for a better husband. And they started off as a couple of struggling uni students, but through dad's amazing drive and determination, he achieved his, achieved his dream to play for Australia. As a result, we as a family have enjoyed the life we have. I, I do want to finish by just um, expressing the gratitude of our family to, to so many people for their support over the last few weeks. Firstly, the career community. Um, it's just been a great reminder of how close-knit this community is and how many wonderful people are in it. Um, we've had so many messages and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's, who's reached out to us. To the SACA, um, Andrew Sinclair and Vicky Jones in particular, a huge thanks for helping organise today. The Australian Cricketers Association, Todd Greenberg, Kelly Appleby and Justine Whipper for helping us get to Bundaberg, which was a you know, very, very tough day for us all, and then the care that they've shown us in the last few weeks. To the Bulls Masters guys, um, Jimmy Ma, Darren Lehman, Ian Healy and Alan Border in particular, 
you were there for us in our hour of need and um, you were just amazing and obviously great mates of Dad's. Um, to Dave Hillier and John Glanville, who were with Dad when he had his heart attack, they did everything they could to save him, including driving 170 kilometres an hour down the wrong side of the road to try to get him to hospital as quickly as they could. To James, Graham, Dennis, Imba, Stumpy, Roshi and Leon, um, for your support, your friendship and um, your beautiful words today. To the Kuyonga Golf Club, which is Dad's favourite place away from home, thank you for your support. I do want to thank, um, from the three boys' perspective, our employers and workmates for the support and flexibility you've all given us over the last few weeks, and just everyone for coming today. Um, as Gilly said in his beautiful video tribute, Dad was a hero to many, he's always been mine. And he always will be. Love you, mate. Please look to the screens. You'll see a photo tribute to the amazing life we're celebrating, and it's accompanied by music from Rod's own playlist.
please now invite Rod's grandchildren, Ella, Jake, Harry, Ryan and Chloe. Come forward and place some roses on the casket. Closing time. I can hear Bacchus saying, what, 12.58? But it is. And I want to thank everyone who's done such a brilliant job of speaking. As I mentioned earlier, people that have come from so far away and paid their respects to, to Bacchus. We leave here with a great sense of what Rod was about. As Dennis said, no one can quite believe that he's not here anymore. We can't believe... He won't be on the end of the phone. The advice he didn't realise he was giving and the love that he lavished on us all. He was a champion in every way. The sense of humour, the sense of mischief, the twinkle in his eye, it shines through in everything everyone said. To Roz and the Marsh family, thank you for making us part of this amazing day. I'd like to invite Simon Berry back to walk you through what happens from here, but thank you all very much. Thank you, James, for leading this service to celebrate Rod's life today. It was brilliant. Thank you. And on behalf of Roz, Paul, Dan, Jamie, Graham and their families, I sincerely thank you all for attending and for those people viewing on the live stream, both overseas and interstate and locally, thank you. In a moment, Rod's family and the pallbearers are going to accompany Rod's casket to the hearse downstairs and then proceed out onto the Adelaide Oval to place a sprig of wattle by Rod's wicket-keeping gloves. You're also asked to remain in this room until directed by my staff to then proceed down the escalators and out onto the Oval, past Rod's casket. Then you will have the opportunity to place a sprig of wattle as a tribute to Rod as well. Please, ladies and gentlemen, then return to the concourse, that's the southern concourse area downstairs, where the hearse will then depart the oval. You're all then warmly invited to return to this room to share stories and memories of Rod's life over beers, certainly red wine and refreshments. Also, can I ask former and current Test and State cricketers to form a guard of honour outside the Oval once you've placed your tributes. Tim Nielsen has kindly agreed with us to coordinate that Guard of Honour, so please follow Tim's instructions. That would be greatly appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, could I ask you to stand and I ask the pallbearers to come forward. <laughs> 